Right now I'm seeing a lot of news stories out there that are aimed at getting people excited about the upcoming rate cuts that the Fed's going to do and how low mortgage rates are going to go. In fact, they're already down to 6.3%. So buyers should be getting ready, right? This is going to be great for the housing market. People should be ready to buy as soon as the rates continue to fall because that's been what a lot of the you know, proponents of the housing market have been saying like, oh, as soon as rates, you know, drop in the fives, then everything's gonna explode. I know Barbara Corcoran, she was one of them that was repeating this nonstop over the past couple of years. And we know that that's not gonna be true because you can already get a mortgage rate in the mid fives if you get a 15 year mortgage right now, and it's not enough to entice people back in. The news outlet Barron's, they did an analysis, okay, on what interest rates would have to drop down to in order for people to buy the median price home today with the median household income. And they determined that it would need to be at 5.25%, which we haven't seen since the middle of 2022, by the way. And the numbers are this. This would be a median income family of 74.5K per year, as well as the median home price of 422,000. And this assumes that you're putting a 20% down payment at a 30 year fixed rate. So there's a lot of assumptions in there, number one, and that is the price of the house, of course, the person's income, as well as the fact that they're putting 20% down, which most people simply don't do. But here's the problem, that only covers the mortgage payment. This math of needing to have mortgage rates come down to 5.25% for the average family to afford the average house, only takes into consideration the actual mortgage payment. And as we all know, owning and buying a house comes with many more expenses than just the mortgage payment. So when you factor in things like homeowners insurance, property taxes, potential HOA fees, upkeep, all sorts of maintenance need to do with the house, now this would mean that mortgage rates would need to drop to a fantasy level of about three and a half percent for the average family to afford the average home guys do you see a future where interest rates on mortgages for 30-year fixed rates are going to come down to three and a half percent anytime soon i do not not even in the next three or four years if ever and if you want to know why the simple answer and reason is because of inflation okay we just can't afford to have rates that low with inflation where it is. They have the official CPI reading sitting at 2.9% right now, and they're already talking about cutting rates, which is almost a guarantee that we're gonna see it go back up once they cut rates a few times, which will likely inevitably re lead to the Fed raising interest rates again at some point down the road once they realize their fatal flaw and their fatal mistake that they had rates too low for too long and even the interest rate increases they did weren't enough to really get inflation under control. Like people need to wake up and realize that we are going to see home prices come down because that is gonna be the only method that homes become more affordable in the future. In fact, when you take a look at this Fred chart that goes all the way back to the early 70s, you can see mortgage rates were never anywhere near three and a half percent, except for a couple of times, guys. And that was when we had the last housing crash and they lowered rates. And also once we had the pandemic and they lowered rates to going that low. So it's reasonable to think that unless we have some other catastrophe that happens that causes the Fed to lower interest rates back to zero again, or maybe even negative interest rates, then there is no chance that people are gonna be getting a 3.5% mortgage, which also means there's no chance that housing becomes affordable for the average person and the average family. So that means the only way housing does become affordable moving forward is how? prices coming down. This is the kind of thing that people need to wake up and understand is that regardless of where interest rates go from here, it's probably not going to be enough to make homes affordable for the average family. And we see it in the data everywhere. You know, right now the 30 year fixed rate is sitting at 6.37%, which sounds like amazingly low compared to where it's been for the last couple of years. Well, when we look at what's happening with the mortgage purchase application index, home sales are in a recession, guys. No matter which way you want to slice it, some people want to, you know, 
use nice words and say that, oh, things are just slow right now, blah, blah, blah. No, it's in a recession. It's not good at all. Take a look at this chart that goes all the way back to the year 2000, the Mortgage Purchase Application Index, and you can see where it is today, pretty much at all time lows. No one is applying to buy houses because no one can afford it. And that is not going to change unless rates and or prices come down significantly. And now that we know that interest rates would have to reach a 3.5% mark to make homes at today's prices affordable, we know that that's not going to happen. That's a fantasy. It ain't happening. So the only thing that is realistic is prices coming down to make up for it. And the other thing is, it's all psychological too, guys. It's not just buyers saying, hey, uh, we can't afford it. That's part of it. But the other part of it is too, is like people who even can afford it are looking at this and saying, why should I buy today when I know in a year or two from now, rates are going to be much lower and I can lock in a lower payment. So I might as well just wait which is the smart thing to do. So people who are smart with their money, that's exactly what they're doing. They are just waiting right now. I personally would like to buy more real estate at some point too, but what am I doing? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the right opportunity to come along, guys. I'm waiting for when it makes sense. I'm waiting for desperation to start permeating throughout the market because you're already seeing it happen in different pockets throughout the country. And I have no doubt it's gonna spread to more. And some people are using the argument like, look, you've seen different markets hold up even in the 7% range and people are still buying. Well, that's because of low inventory and it's because of the income levels of the people who are buying. I talked about this in a video a couple of days ago. You know, the only people who are buying at today's prices are people that can afford to pay cash or people that have family with money and those families are giving people down payments to buy these houses guys the down payments just reach an all-time high according to redfin and many of those down payments are gifted to people who otherwise wouldn't even be able to buy these houses so only people who are doing well right now and people who are already financially advantaged are the ones who are pulling the trigger on these homes and speaking of how much extra it costs to own a house something that people should be aware of is just how much extra guys in fact that guy ramit seti he had his show on netflix a while ago like i'll teach you to be rich or maybe that's the name of his book something like that and he's actually somebody who is a multi-millionaire who is a big proponent of renting and saying, you listen, you don't need to buy your house. And I agree with a lot of his philosophies on that. Now, that's a personal preference too. Like some people just want to own their house so they don't have to move, so they can make different modifications to the house. Those reasons go beyond practical financial reasons, okay? But what we're talking about here is just the nitty gritty of the expense of what it actually costs to own a house. One rule of thumb that he uses and tells people when he deals with all of his financial clients, like if you're looking to buy a house, take whatever the payment is going to be and tack on an additional 50%. And that'll give you the true cost of what it will likely cost you to own that house. And as someone who has owned different properties, I mostly agree with that assessment. It's not always true. Sometimes it's less than 50%, maybe sometimes only an additional 20% on top of what your payment's gonna be. But you can guarantee it will be extra. So what he calls these costs are phantom costs. All that means is there's just hidden costs that people don't think about when they're looking at the cost of buying a home. He considers lots of things phantom costs when it comes to the just the down payment of the house, the interest paid to the bank when you, you know get your mortgage, also the maintenance costs of the house, as well as the opportunity costs of buying a home, as opposed to investing the money in different ways. And in some areas, those phantom costs are just, you know, exacerbated. Like around here, where I'm walking around right now, guys, like in Tiburon, California, in this area, it is so expensive to buy here. Like renting is probably two to three times cheaper. Like it is so much cheaper to rent anything over here, any form of housing 
versus buying. Like it's not even close. And then if you actually take the cost to buy this house over here and then tack on that extra 50%, I mean, it's ridiculous. The costs are so high and it almost, it makes me wonder, you know, what, what's the justification for it? You know, like since I'm somebody that wants to come here in the summertime and spend my summers here, I've thought about buying a second home here, but because of how cheap it is to rent, I may never do that. I may just pocket that extra money and invest it in other ways, just like this guy does and get richer off of that rather than buy a second home here. That's going to cost me double what I'm paying in rent right now to just stay here for a few months out of the year, you know? And then the rest of the time you gotta worry about renting it out or just eating the cost to keep it vacant. There's a lot of problems with owning a second home. You know, there's a lot of extra expenses. Some of the expenses that this guy, Ramit, had to pay for when he owned a home were things like paying for repairs in the basement after a flood paying for a tree removal. Those are very expensive. Replacing old windows and doors with energy efficient ones. And what you notice there is a couple of those expenses are surprise expenses, things that people don't think about. No one ever thinks a tree is gonna fall in their backyard and have to pay to get, get rid of that. No one thinks that it's also gonna cost a few thousand dollars just to get that tree removed either. Same thing with a basement flooding or you know a broken window, something that needs to be fixed that's unexpected. Now, if you're somebody who's skeptical and you're kind of on the fence and you don't know whether or not you should rent or buy, you should definitely do the math yourself and try to take into consideration as many of these phantom costs as possible. But the reality is no matter how good of an equation you put together, there are gonna be expenses that you just don't account for and things that come up as a homeowner that you will just never have to deal with as a renter. And just like this guy, Ramit, I'm not against people buying homes. Like I own my own home. I've given you guys the reasons in the past of why I own my own home. The reality is owning my home still ends up being financially cheaper than if I was renting a similar place. So the numbers still make sense for me, although it's getting closer and closer, guys, I gotta tell you. But as if all these expenses with owning a home isn't bad enough, you know, there's other things that you have to contend with now. In fact, there was a big uh, scandal that just happened recently with title agencies because basically you had real estate agents referring their clients to certain title agencies. And then what they would do is they would inflate the cost of all the closing costs and share some of those extra inflated proceeds with the real estate agent. They had this whole scam going on. And the, the thing is you can't get out of using a title company. Even if you're able to close a real estate deal on your own, like you don't use a real estate agent and you do it all yourself, you still need a closing agent. You still need to have a real estate attorney or a title company perform the closing of that property to make it official. And people are now having to worry about getting scammed with this too. Now for the record, when I was working as a full-time real estate agent, I always referred uh, my clients to use the title company in my office. And the reason was simple because the fees were very good. They were very competitive, number one. They didn't have this kind of scam going on. I never got a single kickback from referring them. And also, it made it easier from an escrow point of view because our company is a brokerage that collects escrow and they could seamlessly transfer the money to the title company for closing. So naturally it made sense to offer it as an option and some many clients used it. But in this scandal that happened, you had four title companies that agreed to pay about $3.3 million in civil claims and all these companies denied wrongdoing. And not that this comes as a huge surprise, but a lot of these scandals were happening in the Washington DC area because they have some of the highest closing costs in the entire country. And you had title companies over there that were basically, basically offering real estate agents direct payments in exchange for customer referrals. Some of them even gave like yacht parties and other perks beyond money as well. I mean, the corruption with everything is just crazy, guys. There are so many things that you just can't trust anymore. And I'm not saying you shouldn't trust the title company referral that your real estate agent gives you in most cases, you probably should, but it wouldn't hurt to shop around a little bit because you can call any title company and just ask them for their price sheet for the buyer's or the seller's price sheet, and it will give you 
all of the closing costs right there. And it's very easy to compare. You get a few of those and you can quickly see if the place that they're referring to you is ripping you off or not. And the other thing to understand is this type of scandal can go on between any sort of referral agreement. Like for example, your real estate agent refers you to a home inspector or a home stager or anybody that offers a service that they don't, there could be one of these kickbacks in the middle. So this is why it's paramount that you just have an agent that you trust. That's why I offer referral services myself, guys, and full disclosure, I get a kickback, okay? If you buy a house through my referral link through one of the agents that I recommend, I will get a commission. But the fees that they charge are not inflated because don't forget, buyers and sellers are completely in control of negotiating the fees that they pay between their buyers or sellers agent. So whatever you end up agreeing to pay them is between you and them. It has nothing to do with me. I have no influence on this whatsoever. But I offer it as a free service to you guys because I have gotten so many people over the years that have reached out to me asking if I could hook them up with a real estate agent and now I can no matter where you live in the United States. And you know the other day I talked about how here in California they are giving illegal immigrants pretty soon up to $150,000 to purchase a house, okay? It is a 0% interest loan that they will give you to buy a house that you don't have to pay back until the house sells, and then you gotta pay it back plus 20% of whatever's the house went up in value. Okay, that's the scheme they got going on here, which probably will come into law. It's gonna to go to Gavin Newsom soon. He's probably gonna sign it. Well, one of my viewers from Washington State, Ava, she sent me this story about how they have a similar program over there now where they are offering the same $150,000 interest-free loan to marginalized home buyers. Now, at least it's not aimed at illegal immigrants, but they are unfairly offering this to marginalized groups. So in order to qualify for this, you have to be either black, Native American, Hispanic, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, somebody like that, okay? You also have to be a first time home buyer. You also must have lived in Washington State before April 1968, or have a parent or great grandparent or grandparent who lived in the state during that time. So you have to have some roots in Washington state. It can't just be somebody who crossed the border yesterday and come in and get this, okay? So at least on that front, that's good. They're not just giving it out to anybody like they are here in California. Hey, you make it, you get 150 grand. They cited a story here on how this worked out for somebody. There was a family, they bought a $719,000 home and they got $143,800 down payment for free. That's the 0% interest loan. Now this loan does have to be paid back when they sell the house. It's not like they totally get the money for free, but then again, the question does get raised of what happens if they never sell the house? What happens if they just keep it and pass it down from generation to generation, which would be the smartest thing to do and the only true way to get away with getting that money for free. But here's the problems I have with programs like this. Number one, it's every taxpayer, regardless of your racial makeup, is paying for this, okay? So no matter what your background is, you're responsible for contributing to making programs like this come into existence. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that a lot of these people that get these loans probably can't afford these houses. Because let's face it, if you are getting almost 150 grand for free to buy a house and you didn't have that money because there are income qualifications as well. Like for example, you need to have an income at or below 100% of the area's median income. So these people don't make a lot of money and they probably would never be able to afford to buy that house without extra money, right? And we just talked about how when you buy a house and you look at your monthly payment, you should add on 50% to give you a more realistic picture of what it's gonna cost you to own that house. These people aren't doing that. So most of them are probably gonna end up either losing the house or they're gonna to have to live with 20 family members to help pay for it because of the astronomical expense involved in owning a home today. And I don't know guys, I feel like there's just too many, you know, movements happening today that are designed to like right the wrongs from the past, you know, because people who are marginalized, you know, weren't treated properly in the past, that somehow people today should make up for it. Well, how, you know, why? 
Why does anybody today have to pay for that? Nobody alive today is responsible for mistreatings in the past, at least most of them aren't, so why does everybody today have to pay for it? To me, it's all just political BS, more excuses to raise taxes on people and suck away the wealth of people who are actually working for it and robbing the rich and giving it to the poor. That's what all this just sounds like to me. So. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.